Pastor Tharps asked me to teach a Bible study tonight on uh, how to read your Bible, how to study your Bible, and I believe I can help some folks tonight. And so, uh, uh, you know, this is the heart of God. This is the mind of God. These are the intentions of God and the promises of God. And uh, boy, what a privilege to uh, be able to teach this tonight. So I'm going to start off with a word of prayer and, uh, and then we'll get right into our Bible study. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to be here tonight. Uh, dear Holy Spirit, all the power that would be available to Pastor Eric Tharp to build the lives of these people tonight, the church that you've given him to be the under-shepherd. Father, I'm going to need every bit of that power to help build the lives of these people. Holy Spirit, may I say everything I should say, nothing I shouldn't. Holy Spirit, please control my mind. And, and dear Holy Spirit, I want to pray for Jeremy Sadler, Lord. Not well. Harvey Sadler, Lord. Uh, with pancreatic cancer, Lord. Oh, my soul. Father, please give them a healing touch. Again, Holy Spirit, please have your will and way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I was contacted a, oh, a couple of days ago, and uh, Pastor Tharp asked me if I would teach a Bible study, and he recommended to me the subject. You say, is that confining? No, that's liberating. <laughs> that's not confining at all. That's uh, that's just a, a, a wonderful opportunity, and so uh, I want to let you know, I don't have my glasses, but I'll finish on time, okay? And uh, uh, I believe I'm on firm spiritual ground when I make the following statements. Number one, God has saved me because he loves me. Amen. Number two, God doesn't want me to squander or waste my salvation. Number three, he has saved me so that I can bring glory to his name. Number four, I can achieve God's objective for my life, bringing glory to his name, by living my life in accordance with his word. Amen. Number five, God has also given me a place to serve him. That place is the local church. Yeah. Number six, I believe service in the local church offers me the greatest opportunities to glorify God. And I believe that Bible reading and Bible study are, are essential for my spiritual well-being and my spiritual growth, but also my spiritual maintenance. Uh, today, I, I brought my little uh, vehicle into the dealership and they performed preventive maintenance. And uh, if you can afford this, if you have a car, and if you uh, follow that preventive maintenance schedule, uh, that car lasts an awful long while. Um, now, of course, they want to make a lot of money, and you may not have to change oil every 3,000 miles, but uh, if, if you follow that, and I believe God has a preventive maintenance schedule for every believer, and it's in his word. Now, I have to share with you something. Um, I have created a biblical fortress, biblical truths that I will never abandon, and uh, nor will anyone or any event ever shake me from these beliefs. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I'm not the greatest Christian in the world. I'm not uh, maybe the greatest man, maybe not the greatest husband, maybe not the greatest father, but I'll tell you this, I, I've learned to show up. Yeah. You, you, can fault, you can fault me for a lot of things, but Brother Thomas is going to show up. Yeah. And the reason I show up is because of these fundamental biblical truths that I believe. If these aren't true, I'm out of here. <laughs> you say, where are you going? I don't know. I ain't going here. Let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. If, this, if these are not true, let's stop playing church, all right? All right. Here's number one. The King James Bible is the every word Bible. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm telling you. <clears throat> now, for you, for you folks that are new here to Trident Baptist Church, uh, I was here uh, when the last pastor resigned. And I was a member of the pulpit committee, and you, you can talk to members of the pulpit committee, and I was a broken record. We were going to have two things here at Trident Baptist Church, or you're going to have to kill me. Number one, we were going to have a pastor that was faithful yes, to the King James. You can ask him. I, I would not budge. <laughs> I would not. And, and number two, we we're going to have a church builder. Yeah. And uh, by the way, 
You build churches on this word. Yes, sir. You build churches on this word. So let me just share this with you. I have got the every word Bible. I've got it. It's absolutely true. It has been preserved in accordance with Psalm uh, verses 6 and 7. I can stake my very life on this book. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, now let me caution you. Stay away from uh, individuals that don't believe this book. Yes, sir. Let me caution you. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have too much respect for evangelicals. Here's why. Uh, I say this word, and my wife really doesn't like me to say this word. They, be they believe the words of God are in the autographs. Yeah. You say, what's an autograph? Uh, come up, I'll give you one after church. Uh, no, uh, they're the original manuscripts. It's what they believe. Yeah. They believe that the word of God... Now, he here's what happened. When they wrote them, they stamped them original. That's what they did. Okay, just, just like we used to do in the military. Remember that, fellas? You know, they stamped it. And so that's what they did. And so these highfalutin, highly educated individuals, uh, they see a parchment and they say, oh, this is an original, right? And so what that means is every other version of the Bible is suspect. They never preach. Those guys don't preach. You know what they do? They convince. They cajole. They're trying to reason with you. I'm so glad I got a preacher. I am so glad I've got a man that can say, Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah, glory to God. So, I've got an every word Bible. Amen. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm saved. <laughs> Folks, I'm saved. Man, I am saved. I, I don't deserve salvation. Listen, I deserve the depths of hell. What a wicked sinner I am. But by God's grace and God's mercy, I have salvation. So I got an every word Bible, and I have got his salvation. Amen. Not only that, I have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Hebrews 13, 5. What a, I'm, I'm never, do you know? How did the Old Testament saints, how did they ever, how did they ever do what they did? Can you imagine living with, without having the Holy Spirit inside you? I can't imagine that. Now let me tell you what the Bible says. Of whom much has been given, much is required. Don't ever take for granted that you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. Not only that, I am sealed unto the day of redemption when Jesus comes to take us home. You say, when is that going to be? Any second now. Any second now. You know, they believe that in the upper room. They believe Jesus was coming back immediately. They sure did. My father believed. He said, Jesus is coming back in my lifetime. Uh, do you believe it? Any second now. I believe that. Hallelujah. Oh, and here's one of my greatest promises that's in this biblical, spiritual fortress I, I built. Jesus makes the promise in Matthew 16, I will build my church. Well, glory, huh? Isn't that wonderful? Listen to me. How about John 1, 11 and 12? He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Listen, I, I may not be much, but I have been given a power source. I have been given a fuel source that can power my life to where I can bring glory to God. Amen. Here's one not too many people like. God always uses a man. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. God always uses a man. Amen. This is the way he operates. This ruffles some people's feathers. <clears throat> yeah, well, well, I'm sorry, I got a little senior chief in me. Tough. <laughs> oh, look at what it says there. Look what the Holy Spirit told the church at Corinth to do concerning the Apostle Paul. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So let me tell you what just some of these great truths can do for me. Listen, if I'll stay faithful to church, if I'll stay faithful to this book, if I will, in, if I will invest and get the Holy Spirit involved in my life, and if I'll follow that man, yes, yeah, if I'll follow that man, yeah. yeah, guess what? I can have my life built so I can bring glory to God. Amen. And then there's a payday coming, folks. Yes, sir. 
Say, why are you doing this? One reason, well done. Yes, sir. Right. So, well done. Yes, sir. I'm not after anything else. You say, you're going to get it? I don't know if I'm going to get it or not. Well done. So let me just go over those again. See, I think it is important for you that you need to build a spiritual fortress to protect your life. Right? Because if you fall away, studying your Bible and reading your Bible is just a form of hypocrisy. You have to survive. You have to spiritually survive. And so let me just encourage you. Believe that this old King James Bible is the word of God. Never take for granted that you're saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the uh, Lord shall be saved. Never, ever ignore the blessed Holy Spirit that lives inside you. Realize that that Holy Spirit has sealed you under the day of redemption. Realize Jesus has given us a promise. I will build my church. Amen. Yes. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become. See, that becoming is a lifelong endeavor of mine. Right? And then follow the man. Follow the man. You say, why? Well, do you know he has a wisdom that none of us have? Yeah. You say, you say, who knows the most Bible in this room? Him? His wife? Yeah. Yeah. You think I'm kidding you, right? No. No. Hallelujah. And let's all shoot for a, uh, a well done, shall we? Let's all shoot for a well done. So let me encourage you to adopt unshakable truths in your life that will anchor your spiritual life to Jesus. And now I'd like to look at some sound biblical guidelines for reading your Bible. Some, you might want to take notes here. Uh, let's look at some sound biblical guidelines for reading your Bible. First. Read it every day. Amen. Read it every day. Yes, you got to read it. Now, if you, now, my kids are all grown. I own my, I own my own business. Uh, my boss is a jerk. <coughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, well, you know, we all have crosses to bear, I guess, right? And so I'm going to share with you my Bible reading. I read a lot of Bible, folks. Okay, and so when I tell you what I read, I'm not expecting uh, you to adopt what I have set for myself as a Bible reading program, but you need to have a systematic Bible reading program, and you need to read it every day, set a time. If you can, set a time. Uh, let me just, I said read it systematically. Let me explain my Bible reading schedule to you. I read a proverb every day read a proverb every day. You say, what do you do on February 28th? Um, uh, I read a few more proverbs. Yeah, is that okay? Right? Okay. All right. Uh, I read a chapter in Acts every day. You say, why do you do that? Um, those are church building chapters. That is uh, the transition between the Gospels and it, it's a bridge, if you will, where the first church builders and then the church ultimately came here, folks, if you want to know the truth. The Apostle Paul uh, started churches in Greece and those churches spread across Europe and they crossed the English Channel and then they crossed the Atlantic. And that's one of the reasons we have it. So I read a chapter in Acts every day. I read five Psalms a day. Five Psalms. Now, for, as far as Psalm 119 is concerned, I read six verses a day. You can get through, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, Psalm 119 has 176 verses. And uh, if you get that in one, one lump, it, it can be a little daunting. So I read six uh, verses a day. But by the way, if, if you want to become a great student of the Bible, you'd want to read Psalm 19. It's, yeah. a, it's a wonderful psalm. Now, I also do this. I read three chapters in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John every day. That gets me through uh, the Gospels in every month, okay? So I'm reading the Gospels every month. I'm reading uh, the book of Acts every month. I'm reading the book of Proverbs every month. I'm reading the, uh, uh, the book of Psalms every month. And then in the Old Testament and the remainder of uh, the, well, I divide the Old Testament into two sections and I read four chapters a day, really eight chapters a day there. And then I read uh, two to three chapters uh, from Romans to the revelation of St. John the Divine. But here's the point I'm making. 
you need to read this book. You, this needs to, listen, I am saturated every day by the things of this world. And Jesus has commanded us to be in this world and not of the world. And the only way I can be in this world and not of the world is I have to have otherworldly guidelines. And that's what these are. You must, you must. Uh, years ago, uh, the Green Bay Packers were having a tough time. They were. And they weren't doing too well. And Vince Lombardi came out at uh, practice and he had a football and he said, fellas, this is a football. <laughs> You say, why did he do that? Had to go back to the basics. Don't, don't ever take for granted the basics of reading the Bible. You have to read it. Now, let, let me say this. Reading is not studying. I would not recommend that you speed read. Don't, don't speed read. Uh, I would just read it normally. And then uh, what we want to do is, see, that gives me a tremendous foundation for studying the Bible. It gives me a tremendous foundation for studying the Bible. So let's go to 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, a very famous verse that uh, many of you know. And, and, and don't let my Bible reading schedule intimidate you. Uh, I've heard that if you read four pages a day in your Bible, you can read it through in an entire year if you do that. You need to become, listen to me, everyone on the sound of, you need to become a student of this word. Right? Listen, I used to study football. <laughs> I did. I really, you can ask Nelson over there. Right? Uh, of course, I don't root for them anymore, but uh, I used to root for the Patriots when they were on a roll. And poor Nelson's a Miami Dolphin fan, and boy, I just give him, I give him one. Not going to do it anymore. Your team's on top now, but uh, uh, listen, if you want to ask me anything about football, I could tell you about football. Uh, did you know that a quarterback in professional football has three seconds to throw the ball? If he doesn't throw the ball in three, those linemen can only hold off those defensive linemen for three seconds. Did you know in the playoffs that goes down to 2.7 seconds? Did you know that? That doesn't amount to a hill of beans. <laughs> Do you know what's in John 17? Do you know what's in John 17? Guess what? You say, who's the GOAT, the greatest of all time? It ain't Tom Brady, it's Jesus. Yeah, that's who it is. Yeah, are you there? Second Timothy 2.15. We are commanded to study our Bible. Study to shew thyself approved, uh, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what God wants us to do is God wants us not only to read this book, but he also wants us to study this book. And I want to give you some guidelines for that if I could. But let me first define the word study. Uh, in the, and I'm not a big Greek guy, but uh, uh, the, the, the sense of the word in the Greek is this, is, is that there's, a, there's an urgency to it. There's an urgency to it, and it's a, a, a diligent effort. And then the, the Webster's 1828, which is not too bad of a little resource, is to fix the mind closely upon a subject to muse, to dwell upon a thought. So let's marry these two definitions if I could. I, I want to have a diligent effort to fix our minds on a biblical subject or dwell upon a spiritual thought. Amen. See, see, <clears throat> uh, if you will, this is like medicine, okay? It's like medicine. Bible study is like surgery. <laughs> It's like surgery. And you say, what is the surgery for? To get the sin out of my life. Yes. Sir. yes. And so uh, let's take a, a look at a few things uh, that I want to suggest as, as far as studying your Bible. Um, <clears throat> and, and one of the purposes for studying the Bible, it's not for information. It's, it's not, you know, nanny, nanny, boo-boo, I know more than you do, right? No, no, that's, that's not what it's about, Right. It is um, the objective here for studying the Bible is not just for information, but <clears throat> it's to study it with the objective of helping the pastor build the church. That's what God's called me here. That's what God's called me here. I have some jobs to do in this place, and God's called me for those jobs, and I have to stay faithful to them, okay? And so remember what you want to do. 
I'm going to make a suggestion that when you do study your Bible, that you, you study it with a set of blinders. Um, and, and here's what I want the blinders to be. You're going to study it in light of helping God build this church and helping this pastor build the church. You don't want to go off on a tangent. You don't, you don't want, listen, I listen to very few Bible teachers and Bible preachers. You say, why? Uh, because they just, they're all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, and by the way, what they teach really is not helpful if you want to know the truth, right? You know, I, what I need to know is, uh, how am I going to handle little Johnny on Sunday, right? Little Johnny doesn't want to be here, right? How am I going to help uh, uh, little Joe in junior church who's bored stiff, right? Bored stiff, right? How am I going to help them? And so if I can focus my Bible study on that, let me tell you the great opportunity that presides. I'm going to hook into some promises of God. If you can coordinate your service to, co to uh, have those, if you will, and the pastor loves this word, he, he loves the word synergy. If you can get uh, your efforts to study the Bible, I will build my church. Okay, Jesus, I, I'm going to study my Bible because I want to help build the church. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be followers of me even as I also am Christ. So if I dedicate myself uh, that I am going to uh, do everything I can within my power to help that man build this church, now I've, ho now I've hooked into two promises. Now I've hooked it. And boy, when you hook into promises of God, that's a good thing. You get God's attention. When you start hooking into the promises of God, and you can say this, God, you promised David. God, you gave it, you gave it to Joshua. God, you gave it to Noah. Can you give it to me? Ooh, yeah. God likes that. You say, how do you know that? Well, what did he tell Moses? says, get out of the way. I'm going to kill all these guys. Get out of my way. I'm going to kill them all. Well, they said, I wouldn't do that. You know what they'll say in Egypt? They'll say, you weren't able to bring them in to the Holy Land, and they will criticize your name. You, you realize this is about God's name, right? Yeah. That's what this is about, God's name, right? So, uh, and let me just, uh, if I can, give you a, a graphic example of why I want to study the Bible. That's going to give me knowledge, okay? It's going to give me knowledge. But the goal is wisdom. Now, let me see if I can explain this to you the way I explain this to kids in junior church, okay? I'll do that. Brother Dotson, I'm going to use this little microphone now, okay? All right. When you study your Bible, you will acquire information and knowledge, okay? This is a $10 bill. That's knowledge, okay? Now, what you want to acquire to help build this church is you want to acquire a godly understanding. So, this is money. <laughs> Yeah, you could do a lot of things with money, right? Yeah, I said, you know what the kids are doing, right? Give me, give me, give me. Oh, earn it yourself, you little, oh, no, we don't say that. Uh, you wonderful, blessed child. <laughs> Get a job. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, this is money, and you can do a lot of things with money. Okay, that's, listen to me, that's understanding. What do you buy? What do you buy? That's wisdom. What do you buy? So let me tell you what God wants you to do. God wants you studying the Bible so you can gather information. And then, as you are faithful to church, you will be in a preaching service where it will all come together, where the pastor can preach his heart out, and now he can take that knowledge that you, that you have, and now he can give you some biblical understanding, and now you can have some wisdom. Why? To help him build this church. See, it is so important that you don't miss a church service. Now, folks are here on Wednesday night. Uh, I'm glad you're here, and, and you're usually here on, on Sunday morning and Sunday school, but... Uh, uh, 
one of the reasons we have anemic churches all over the country is because of this principle. We have people that uh, are not acquiring godly knowledge, right, through the Bible reading. They're not acquiring godly knowledge through the study of God's Word, and their pastors are not preaching. So that knowledge, if you will, cannot be transformed into uh, a biblical understanding and a biblical wisdom. Oh, my soul. Listen to me. Now, let me just give you a quick definition of wisdom. (laughs) It's to do those things that God wants you to do and do them the way God wants them done and to keep yourself from doing things that God doesn't want you to do. There's There's an action involved in wisdom and there's a restraint involved in wisdom. There's a simpler uh, definition. uh, To see this world the way God sees it and act accordingly. But folks, you need wisdom. Folks, you need wisdom. You don't need to play church. You need need wisdom. You see, um, we can beat you up. Okay? We can beat you up. You know what that, you know what good that does? Nothing. It doesn't do any good to beat you up. But however, if you have a pastor who says this to you, you know, if you want to save your spiritual life and the life of your children, and if you want to have a spiritual future, you need to get busy in this church. And oh, God, the Holy Spirit wants you to find a job in this church. And God, the Holy Spirit needs you to... Guess what? That's better than beating up. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit can get a hold of you. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. He sure does. So... I am going to give you some recommendations for a Bible study, but I first want you to understand, I want you to study the Bible like this. I want you to study it like this. I want you to study it to gain information to help build this church and help this man as he builds this church, right? So here's my first principle of Bible study. Be faithful to church. Uh, I had a fellow years ago. He said, uh, you know an awful lot of Bible. I looked at him and I said, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, right? <laughs> you know, if I was an electrician, I'd better be able to pull some wire, right? If I'm a painter and I, I've been laying down paint for 30 years, I'd better be able to slap some paint around. You know that, folks? Well, listen, I have been faithful to, to a Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, soul winning. And you acquire, you acquire a knowledge that gets transformed into a biblical understanding, which gets transformed into a wisdom, into wisdom, and you can have an abundant life. I go into junior church and I say, anybody want to know who the happiest person is in junior church? Would anybody care to guess? And they all point to me, right? And I said, do you know why? I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm where God wants me to go. I'm there at his permission. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I've told this story. I'll tell it again. Pastor Tharp came to us on a Wednesday night, and he was sitting over there, and I was sitting here, and after church was done, I handed him a letter. I said, here's my letter of resignation. (laughs) And he opened it up, and it said, I'll leave junior church anytime you're ready. If you got somebody you want to replace me. I'm teaching a Sunday school class. If you want to replace me, you can. I don't know. Maybe the guy's bringing somebody, right? Maybe he's got a ringer he's bringing. I don't know, right? Yeah, maybe, right? Guess what? I'm still there. Can I tell you something? He doesn't have to worry about junior church. He doesn't have to... He doesn't have to do this. I wonder if the lawn's going to get mowed. I wonder if the church is going to get cleaned. By the way, those are great jobs. The people that do that, those are wonderful jobs. They're one, listen, I'm so glad you do them. Listen, but he doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to worry about junior church. You say, why? I'm there. And I'm going to be there. You say, why am I there? Right here. Amen. Right here right here. So, you have to be faithful to 
to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night soul winning, he that winneth souls is wise. Do you realize the biblical truth that is dispensed from this pulpit? Do you realize it? Do you realize, if you will, do you realize the education you are, biblical education you're getting when this man preaches or, or when Brother Doug preaches, I mean, or Brother McHale, listen, they're all Bible college graduates. Good night. Do you realize it? Well, listen, <clears throat> you have to come here and hunger and thirst for, for righteousness. You have to do it. So you've got to be here. Okay. If you're going to study the Bible. Oh, we got, yeah, 10 minutes, I think. Is that right? 10 minutes, I think. Anyways, we're good. Um, Listen now, I'm talking about studying the Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you all things. Listen, remember I said reading is not studying, okay? But as you're reading, ask the Holy Spirit to stop you. Ask the Holy Spirit to stop, right? John 14, 26, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You say, what do I need? I don't need some superfluous biblical truth off the wall. I need something that's going to keep me faithful to church, going to help that man build this church and where I can be an encouragement to him, right? Listen, let me say this. The Holy Spirit will never encourage you to contradict the pastor. So, I don't know if this is happening, but if you're in this congregation and you're teaching the Bible, do me a favor. I'll be nice. Be quiet. Right? You have no right to teach anybody the Bible. You don't. Uh, Years ago, I had a gentleman. No one knows who this is. And he was describing to me what he was going to (laughs) do. And this guy was out to lunch. This guy was going to do things that were complete. They were completely against this word. Do you say, get on him, Brother Thomas? I said, no, go talk to the pastor. You know, if I tried to change him, you know what he'd do? Probably punch me in the nose, right? Right? Yeah. You don't want to punch him in the nose. Yeah. You bet bet your life. Yeah. Yeah, nobody messed with Moses. Nobody messed with Noah. Nobody messed with Joshua. Nobody messed with Daniel. Okay? So, um, have the Holy Spirit to teach you where you need to stop, right? And again, the Holy Spirit's not going to contradict the pastor's teaching, okay? Don't uh, buy into anyone that contradicts his teaching, okay? Stay away from non-church teachers. Man, there's so many of these idiots online. Stay away from them, okay? And as you read, and remember, reading leads to to, uh, uh, a study, ask the Holy Spirit Uh, to stop you where there are study opportunities and pray as you study. Now, here's what I'd like to do. I think I got 10 minutes. I want to share with you, if I could, a Bible study I had the privilege of conducting. And it's about Joseph. Joseph's quite a guy. Did you know that? Did you know there are Bible scholars? And they say that Joseph, more than anyone, typifies the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Wow. And I did a little study of Joseph. And uh, we start off, and Joseph is 17 years old, and he's hated by his brothers, okay? Uh, That's Jacob's problem, okay? Uh, Jacob uh, played favorites, okay? So what (coughs) Joseph is running into is he's running into a problem, a daily problem he faces because of a mistake of a parent, You know, if I were to go around this room, I bet you some of you would tell me that your parents made a mistake. Can I make a suggestion? Think of anything good that your parents did. Think of anything good that your parents did. Think about that. But that was Jacob's problem, and you remember the story. uh, the, uh, (coughs) The brothers are off watching the sheep, and they're watching them in Dothan, and and Jacob says, uh, go check on your brothers. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not just put a bullseye on him, Jacob? All right, I mean, right? Yeah, go see how your brothers are doing, right? Okay. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> sure, Jacob, anything you say, right? You realize these guys are human, right? You realize they got faults, right? Okay. And so Jacob goes, and uh, his brothers see him far off, and 
and they, uh, they say, let's kill him. Wow. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Never underestimate uh, the damage that sin can do in your life. Listen to me. Listen to me. Every sin you commit puts you on the staircase that leads you to the king's rooftop and Bathsheba's up there, okay? Every sin. Every sin is treacherous. Every sin is deadly. There's no such thing as innocent sins. And, uh, of course, Reuben tries to uh, save his younger brother, and they throw him in a pit and uh, sell him to some Midianites. Yeah, 30 pieces of silver. And, and uh, Reuben comes back and says, what have you done? Well, where is he at? And, and, of course, you know, they kill an animal, and, and uh, they put the blood on the coat, and they tell Daddy, you recognize this coat, Daddy? What disrespect, huh? Yeah. Wow. Uh, let's, let's go here again. Are you disrespectful to your parents? No. Oh, wait a second now. See, Bible study, okay? Bible study to help build this church and to help. See, there are people in here crippled by, uh, by situations that you've had with your family. Yeah. See, Bible study is for a purpose. It's to help build this church. It's to help build. It's to help this man. Yep. Yeah, I'm telling you. And so, and what do they do? They sell him into Potiphar's house, right? Um, it's not fun to be a slave. Okay. And what does Joseph do? Joseph, Joseph works heartily, right? He's working like he works for God. You know, if I go on your work job, are you the best workman there? Well, are you the be- are you the best? See, in Potiphar's house, the slave, the Hebrew slave, was the best. Are you the best at your job? I tell the boys and girls in, in junior church, are you the best student in school? And they look at me, oh, boy. I'm so glad nobody preached like this when I was in school. Holy mackerel. Wow, I would have dropped out in the fifth grade, I think. But uh, so, and then, of course, and then, of course, Potiphar's wife lies and tries to entice uh, Joseph, and he doesn't. Uh, surrender to that enticement. Don't you surrender to enticements. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. Don't you surrender to enticements. Do you see how Bible study can be used to build a church? Do you see that? And so Joseph goes to jail. And uh, there are people who believe, I don't know, they believe he might have been in jail for 10 years. 10 years, right? Uh, I I don't believe in... uh, in honoring, um, you know, I've heard people give testimonies and they, they tell about this, uh, you know, the wicked past life they've lived and all that sort of stuff. And I, I'm not really too much for that. But uh, let me just tell you this, okay? I, I deserve hell. Uh, I bet you I'm the only person here who's woken up in jail and didn't know why I was there. You try that sometimes. Wake up in jail and go, what did I do? Did I kill somebody? Why am I here? So Joseph runs the jail, right? Joseph Joseph is again working for God. He is working for God. He is not letting his problems cripple him. He's working for God. He's looking for a payday. Well done. And you know, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, Pharaoh's servants, the baker and the butler, Cooks always get a raw deal, folks. I just thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> I was cooking in the military, but uh, yeah, somebody was trying to give me a hard time the other day, and I looked at him and I said, please, I was a cook in the military. You're going you're gonna to have to do a lot better than that. You want to get next to me. But uh, so, you know, they have a dream, and they look troubled, and Joseph says, well, tell me your dream. Tell me your dream. And they tell him his dream, and Joseph interprets it and says, the button, listen, you're going back to work, and uh, uh, Mr. Baker, I'm sorry, you must have messed up on them biscuits, buddy, because you're going to die, all right? And then uh, two whole years go by. Where were you two years ago? Where were you two years? And what were you doing two years ago? He was in jail for two years. Unbelievable. And then you remember, Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. And he's dreaming about cows and dreaming about corn. And uh, I think those are pretty good things to, to dream about if you're going to dream about. And then the butler goes, boy, I know my mistake now. 
he said, uh, there's a guy in the prison. He can interpret dreams. And so they bring Joseph up and clean him up. And, of course, he interprets the dream and, and tells Pharaoh, listen, we're going to have seven years of plenty, and then we're going to have seven years of famine. And uh, Pharaoh, you, you, you'd be smart to look somebody out to take care of that. Did you know God wants to re promote faithful people? Yeah, that's what he wants. He wants to promote faithful people. You know why I'm here tonight? Nothing special about me. I just keep showing up. Really? I'm not the greatest Bible preacher. I'm not the greatest Bible ex expositor. Are you kidding me? Oh, I, I thought expositor was something you did with a camera or something like that, right? <laughs> so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge, right? And boy, he, he's second in command. Wow, that, that, that's quite a tr transition, right? That's quite a transition going from, uh, going from the jailhouse uh, right to the palace, right? And of course, you know, he, he gathers up the corn and then the seven years of famine come and, and Jacob tells his uh, boys, he said, yeah, go on down and they got, some, they got corn in Egypt, go down there and take care of us. And of course, Joseph recognizes them and, uh, and you know how he puts their money back in the sack and, he, and then he wants, uh, he wants Benjamin to come with him the next time. And then Benjamin does come, and the, then he puts the cup in Benjamin's, Benjamin's little sack. You know, this passage is taught this way, how to overcome adversity. Yeah. Did you know that's not what this is about? It has nothing to do with that. I say, what are you talking about? See, in Genesis 15, Abram has a nightmare. And in this nightmare, God tells him, your descendants are going down into Egypt for 400 years. Look at me. Everything happened to Joseph from God's perspective for one reason. 66 people have to get out of Palestine and they have to go to Egypt. That's why, that's why all of this happened to Joseph. You know, as soon as you realize that God doesn't just know the big picture, he is the big picture. Yes, sir. He, he's the big picture. Yeah. 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 So everything that happened to Joseph, being hated by his brothers, being sold into slavery, uh, spending time in jail, that all happened for one reason. God said, you are going to go down to Egypt for 400 years, and I'll do whatever it takes to get you there. What's stopping you? What, what's stopping you? See, you need to get a hold of God's big picture and stop worrying about, and, and please, I'm not minimizing your problem. Some of you have some terrible problems in here, but they've crippled you so you can't serve in this church, and that is not God's purpose for your life. God wants you, God wants you uh, into this book, and God wants you to know this book, and God wants you to study this book, and God wants you to serve here. What he wants. That's what he wants. You see, God knows what he's doing. Uh, what's your problem? My God's coming back in any second. What's your problem? Well, somebody betrayed you? They betrayed Joseph. Um, somebody cruel to you? They were they were cruel to Joseph. Oh, by the way. Joseph lived as an Egyptian. That's not good news, folks. Joseph married a heathen woman. Not only that, she was the daughter of a heathen priest. Yeah. Wait a second now. When Joseph is there with his brothers, Joseph is eaten with the Egyptians. He doesn't come over and eat with his brothers. No. He's all in as far as Egypt is concerned. Then God moves on his heart. Let God move on your heart. You say, how will he do that? Through these words of this book. Amen. Right? Through the study of this book, through the preaching of that man. He'll do it. Don't you want God to do it? Man, oh man, I'm one of the happiest guys in the world. You say, why? 
because this Sunday I'm going to be in junior church. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Sing! Hey, you down there, sing! <laughs> Some of you let your kids stay in here. And they're not paying attention to him. They're playing. You need to send them in the junior church with me. You say, why? Stop your playing! Pay attention to me! This is the word of God! He can't do that. He can do that to you, but not to kids. So, I want you to know this book. I want you to study this book. Why? To help build this church. To support that man as he builds this church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I... I tried to teach it and preach it like you wanted me to. Oh, Holy Spirit, I hope I was successful. Holy Spirit, would you please touch the hearts of these two? Father, they're not bad people here. They're wonderful people here. Father, they're people that, Father, uh, they're battling so many things, Lord. And, Father, you want them to have the victory over that, and you're prepared to give them the victory over that. And, Father, service is a doorway that opens up victory to those heartaches and tribulations. So, Father, would you have your will and way? And in just a moment, folks, I'm going to have an invitation. And here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask if you, you haven't been reading your Bible to come and make a commitment to read your Bible. If you've maybe read your Bible and you've stopped reading your Bible, I want you to restart. And then, if you are reading your Bible, I'd like you to come and just commit that you'll continue to read your Bible. And then I want you to do this. I want you to tell God, God, use me to help build this church. Use me to help my pastor. Oh, God, would you please do that? Can we have everyone stand, please?